going to talk about farm subsidies. I'll just go ahead and give you our conclusion right now. <laughs> farm <laughs> subsidies are bad. <laughs> and they ought to be done away with. Um, well, well, why? Can we tip this up? I think we always, I think we always have that problem. Yeah, read through, read through, 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 read through the book. Read through the book. Oh, I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we always have problems with uh, that being done. Yeah, it keeps on to me. Right. Subsidies are bad, and they ought to be done away with. Okay. Any disagreement? Okay. <laughs> Let's go eat. Uh, no, well, we want to motivate you to, to really realize why. So we're going to give you the gory details. Now, I could, li I could say all these numbers all day long in the economic theory, and I'll give you just a little dose of that. Um, but what we have is a, a bona fide insider in the agricultural rent-seeking game, <laughs> Les Watts here. He's, he's willing to come out and talk about it and, and call it what it is and reveal the... Uh, absurdity in the outrage. So it's kind of like a horror movie, right? You know how this is going to end. Right? But it's you're kind of compelled to watch it anyway, right, to see the, uh, the gore. Okay, some quick numbers on U.S. farm. Now, we're not going to, we, we can by no means go into uh, detail on all the federal farm programs in the short space of time. And there's a whole lot of them, and I, I hardly know anything about it other than the few my dad's involved with. But we're talking some pretty big money, 260 billion over the last 15 years. Some years, and we're and we're talking strictly subsidies here. The USDA spends a lot more money than this, but we're talking about money that USDA channels, right? Checks they write to farmers for either growing crop X or for uh, using farming practice Y or for installing equipment Z, so on and so forth. Some years higher than others. You can see it's in the 10 to 30 billion range. Um, as many as 2 million people re, uh, participate in each year. But as with most uh, rent seeking, it's very concentrated. There's an elite group of rent seekers who are uh, taking the lion's share of the money, 10%, getting an average of 31,000. That doesn't even do justice. I'll give, get a little more detail. The really top tier are getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And there's a bottom tier that's just a bunch of pikers. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> All right, now I want to just briefly run through that. There is no economic rationale. If there were, it would be one of these two categories. Public good, right? Things that entrepreneurs do not face the proper incentives to do in the market. National defense would be a classic example. Building roads, although with new technology, that's, uh, that argument is weaker and weaker. Corn is not a public good, right? You grow corn, you sell it in the market, you reap the whole profit, right? Whoever uh, buys it reaps the whole benefit. Public goods do not apply at all. Public goods are uh, rationales for subsidy. They might apply in other fields, right? But they do not apply in agriculture. No economist will tell you that they do. Externalities. My business transactions have a negative effect on you, right? You're a third party, you had no say in the matter. They're okay, there are some economic uh, arguments to be made for either subsidizing activity X, if it confers positive benefits on you, or prohibiting taxing activity Y, if it confers negative uh, costs on you. There are some uh, significant negative externalities involved with agriculture. The classic examples would be chemical runoff. So if I fertilize my field uh, excessively, it gets into the water supply, it runs downstream, it goes down the river and affects your water quality. All right? Maybe there's a, a rationale for government involvement. The global warming the, being the biggest negative externality of all time, I think. <laughs> we all might die if that's true. The worst predictions are true. But economists would say, well, yeah, if there is our, if there is room for government involvement, if this is a significant problem, and it might be, I don't want to comment on that today. But economists are pretty much of one mind, well, the proper response would be to tax the things that are causing the negative externality rather than subsidize a possible unknown, unproven alternative like, uh, like ethanol. Now, ethanol is not a, US, uh, it's not a USDA farmer subsidy. It's, it's done at a different level, so we're not going to comment on it. But externality arguments are there, but nobody's making externality <coughs> arguments for this kind of subsidies we're talking about. 
there have been problems with wind erosion in the 1930s. And there were there were government uh, programs that were put into place to correct these that yeah, maybe at the time might have had some uh, some sound economic basis, but no longer. And you, and you won't see people making the externality arguments. So what argument are they making? Here are some official rationales for the subsidies that you hear the politicians, the bureaucrats, the USDA personnel make. They'll talk about food security, food safety. Uh, we need to subsidize it so we have a guaranteed uh, domestic crop because we can't trust those darn foreigners, like that kind of thing. Uh, concert, environmental language, conservation, sustainability, that's every other word coming out of the USDA uh, operative's mouth. But really, they can't even hide, they can't uh, sugarcoat it. And frequently I'm encountering in the publications and the speeches the term income security or safety net. They're pretty blunt about it because it's hard to deny that what's going on here is a transfer, is strictly a transfer of income from the federal taxpayer to the farmer. And it, you, can't, you can't cover it up. You can't say it's for a different purpose. So they, have, they say, yeah, this is for income security. Right? Well, if, yeah, people ought to be secure in their income, shouldn't they? There ought to be a safety net for farmers. Uh, you might become a little bit outraged by that when you realize that farm incomes are actually something like 20% above the average income, <laughs> partly because we've been giving them such darn good income security for the past 80 years. But anyway, Bastiat, this is, this is accurate, and this is what Bastiat would call legalized plunder. And this is what it is, right? I don't think it's going to be hard for you to uh, come to that conclusion as well. Economists since Adam Smith have critiqued, free market economists have critiqued subsidies on these grounds then. There's no economic basis, so they're inefficient, they're wasteful, they're unjust, right? But this is what Bastiat would say. This is plunder. This is an income transfer from taxpayer Y to farmer Z. And it's involuntary. They distort markets in many, many ways, some of which we'll get into, so I don't want to say too much here, but it's just an interference with the market economy, with the natural function of the market economy. Much to the detriment of the, the real unseen victim group here, the foreign farmers who saw Either crops are excluded by a tariff or a subsidy to local farmers, which increases supply and pushes down price. But they don't vote in the U.S. Congressional elections, <laughs> right? So, who cares? <laughs> now, if you're, familiar with, <laughs> if you're familiar with economics at all, we have a really solid explanation. It's called public choice theory, and specifically the, uh, the book Logic of Collective action here by Mansur Olson laid this out back in the 60s. I call it the political formula, right? If you want to rent seek, if you want to seek subsidies, legalized plunder through a political program, you better follow this formula or it might not work. You need to concentrate the benefits on a well-defined localized interest group. Uh, a special interest group is what they're commonly called. Um, Milton Friedman called them pressure groups. Right? But this is a small group of people with kind of a cohesive purpose and a similar um, outlook in life. And you disperse the cost of this across as many people as you possibly can. Right? Well, with the, anything done by the U.S. government, the cost is spread across all federal taxpayers. Right? The subsidies are concentrated on a group of no more than 2 million farmers. Now, the real subsidies are concentrated on the, on the top 10% or even the top 1% of that group. So we're talking about... 100,000 people getting subsidized by 100 million taxpayers, right? So it can be worth hundreds of thousands into the millions of dollars for each individual recipient. The cost for each individual taxpayer is maybe in the hundreds of dollars, right? Who has more incentives to lobby about either maintaining or getting rid of the subsidies? Well, if I've got a million dollars at stake, I'm a well-positioned farmer, you better believe I'm going to lobby, right? And the, uh, the Farm Bureau is gonna, has lobbyists in Congress, right? And they're going to fight tooth and nail to maintain, not only maintain, but to increase the subsidies. The rest of us, if we even know about it, right, which is an elite group of economically informed citizens, such as you all, if you even know about it, where do we even begin fighting it? Are we going to organize and hire lobbyists? You know, Boss Jazz Society is not political, so we can't hire lobbyists. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get the ball rolling somewhere else. But... The incentives are going to break down for us, right? So hence, you see the, the largest uh, <coughs> the largest farm, this would be the, the, the focus group of rent seekers, so this would be the top 12% receive 60% of the payments. That is not surprising. That is the political formula. Right. So subsidies, subsidies are bad, right? And we should be irritated. I, I hope 
I kind of hope at the end of this you're kind of fighting mad. <laughs> right, Congressman, ah, don't waste your time, right? Just tell your friends, right, that this is what's going on in, in D.C. Um, what more can we say, though? Well, when, we, when our insider, our bona fide um, agricultural rent seeker gets up here and, and spills his guts on what's really going on here, <laughs> you're not only going to see that this is naked political plunder, that's easy, but you're going to see it's incoherent, it's absurd, it fails by its own terms. Right? So you're left to no other conclusion. And when, when Dad first got into farming and he started telling me about all these crazy programs, I said, well, what are they trying to accomplish with this? We eventually realized. It's not trying to accomplish anything other than uh, doing what politicians do best, right? Handing out other people's money. Uh, James Bovard, who's this great libertarian journalist, said it so eloquently way back. For almost every farm program, there's another people that opposite farm program. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll give you some great details of that when, uh, when Wes begins. So that's all I have to say. I'm going to turn it over to the expert and uh, he'll share, he'll shed some light on this. Well, I want to thank Brad and thank all of you for inviting us here. This is a beautiful area. I've never been in South Carolina before and I'm very impressed. It's very green, very beautiful, friendly people, intelligent people. And so Thank you. I do, I, I spoke with a couple people who do have some background or family in production agriculture. And one lady who's uh, on the board of the local conservation district and uh, the other gentleman who's, uh, there you are, whose father was an uh, extension agent in Ohio. And are there any other people who have direct family members that are in or have been in production agriculture? A few. Well, for the rest of you, I have some, some really bad news. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to bring this to you, but I believe it was last week, Secretary Bilsack, um, Department of Agriculture, <clears throat> because of trying to get control of the federal budget, announced mm -hmm. that the No Your Farmer program is being so, mo most of you who do not know personally a farmer, <laughs> as far as the government is concerned, are out of luck. However, <laughs> I have a market solution. And I haven't determined my fee structure yet, but <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if you're depressed a little bit and you're having some psychological problems because you do not know a farmer, I'm going to set up a little website and a fee structure and I'll communicate with you. <laughs> ho hopefully that will solve that problem. There are market solutions. <laughs> well, we're going to... Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my operation in our area of the world and then I've got a, a quote from Bastiat. Um, and then, then we'll get into the meat of everything. Uh, I operate a very small uh, cattle and what we call dry land or non-irrigated farm operation in southeast Colorado. Uh, I do have uh, the 266 acres of dry land or non-irrigated farmland. That's a very small, it's in two fields, very small chunk of real estate. And I have that uh, custom farm that I help uh, the younger man that does the farming, he owns the equipment, I help him some when he needs help, and I help him some on his other operation. I have the 110 acres of conservation reserve program ground. We'll talk more about that. And then I've got some native range ground, uh, and then depending on the year of what we need and what's available, in the fall and winter, which is common, uh, the farther west you go, we graze crop residue, grain sorghum stalks, uh, Wheat stubble that has volunteer winter wheat in it, which is excellent. Uh, sometimes uh, we get to graze some growing drilled winter wheat. Uh, we're in the High Plains region, which is the short grass prairie. And it's what's common refer commonly referred to as flyover country. Uh, maybe some of you have lived in the Kansas, Nebraska, Montana. Or maybe, maybe you've had the misfortune to drive through. <coughs> uh, it's a little different than what it looks like going down the interstate. And to me, it's a tremendously interesting, vibrant place. I mean, and I love it. I mean, I, this is beautiful here, but that, that's 
the country that I understand. <clears throat> it is an extremely harsh climate. Uh, average rainfall right in my area is 14 inches a year. Okay. That may come a year ago in May, we got five inches in one day. Uh, the first the first half of the year was was really wet, beautiful. Uh, from August 1st, uh, 2010 until now, we've received eight inches total. Most of that in half inch, quarter inch, three tenths of an inch. And the evaporation factor is so great, two days later you can't tell that you got anything. So, <clears throat> the common hazards, Tyler put these up here, uh, blizzards, drought, hail. Uh, so far this year I've not received a hailstorm that I know of on my place. Last year I had two hailstorms. <clears throat> uh, they came with the five inches of rain from hen egg size down to OP size. Uh, completely, and that came at the end of April, really when the growing season is just starting. I, I don't want to go, I could go on in the geography lesson. <laughs> had baseball size uh, and everything in between. High winds early and late frosts. Uh, the best way to describe the climate, I've come up with this after 61 years, it's just extremes. You'll have the driest July ever with the least wind ever, followed by a three inch rain on August 1st, and the coolest August ever with the most wind. Then you'll go into September, the wind will only blow one day, but it will be 60 miles an hour. <laughs> it's just, it's different all the time. Uh, the days get shorter as you get to December 21st, and they get longer as you get to June 21st. That's about the only predictability. <laughs> uh, we had almost no, well, I'm going on too long. Yeah. I, could, I could go on and on. But I think you've got the basic point. It's non-irrigated dryland farming, the primary uh, cultivated crops are winter wheat, grain sorghum, which we call milo, uh, quite a few sunflowers, oil sunflowers growing. Overall, and I think you'll see, the farther, especially the farther west you go on the high plains, the land is best suited for cat raising cattle. Uh, dry land farming. And dry land farming works best, it's been said, in a wet year. <laughs> yes. What is the uh, altitude of your... Right, I'm at 4,200 feet. And, uh, of course, the farther west you go, it goes up. The lowest point in Colorado is about 3,300 feet. Uh, hopefully I can read this and <clears throat> sound like it. I did get out of public school. This is a quote from Bastiat, and he's talking about the United States. Undoubtedly, as long as there is in a country an abundance of uncultivated land, the existence of such land will of itself hinder the cultivated land from acquiring an undue value. To that, I say to Bastiat, you did not know about the United States Department of Agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to get up here with my notes, Tyler. Uh, this is one of my fields last year. I think this picture was taken in August. This is grain sorghum. The county average, in, in, or the average in my part of the county, is 30 bushels an acre a year. This made 51 bushels. It was it was an excellent crop. It was that wet first half of the year that I talked about. Uh, we did have this is March 9th, 2011. That was our heaviest snowstorm. Uh, the next day it was gone. Probably, a, uh, I think I recorded a third of an inch of moisture with that. Um, we had almost no snow this winter, which is typical. I've, I've got to tell you this, 2007, December 31st, 2006, we had a three-foot snowstorm. <clears throat> the following five, that was on a Friday, the following five Fridays we had between two and six inches added on top of that. The average temperature for February and in January, we're 20 degrees below normal. It didn't melt till the middle of March. Snow this steep. It did drift a little bit, but and so we go from no snow. But anyway, <laughs> and this picture was taken May 20th, 2011. That's native range. It, 
it was, it's a pretty dry year, but it's typical. Uh, July 4th, this, a week ago now, that is CRP ground that I am using, and it, I can explain that a little bit, but it, it's basically set aside ground. This is native range on Monday, and the CRP in the background. You can see that we did have a little bit of rain, it's, it's greened up, and we're quite happy with that. You might not be here, but we're quite happy with that. Okay, now into the into the bones of the structure here. Got this little glossary. You all know what the United States Department of Agriculture is, USDA. The FSA is the Farm Service Agency, and this is where the bureaucrats reside. <laughs> the NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and I was telling the young young lady that I've got a lot of good friends in uh, they, they know my position that I'm taking here. These are what I call the true believers. They're sincere people that are, are really, by and large, interested in, in doing the right thing. RMA, we'll talk about later, is the Risk Management Agency. Uh, this is a, farmers don't deal with the Risk Management Agency. They're the ones that subsidize the multi peril crop insurance to a private insurance company. So the subsidy does not go to the farmer, it goes to the private insurance company, and thus it's hidden from all of you. Uh, quite significant in our area. DCP, this is the Direct Encounter Cyclical Program, uh, which is a direct payment to the farmer. It's what I call payment for being a farmer. <laughs> if, if you have a wheat, corn, grain sorghum base, and there's some others, and you own that base, you qualify for a DCP payment. You do not have to do one thing other than sign the paperwork to receive that payment. You don't have to till the land. You don't have to plant. Uh, you don't have to plant the crop you're being paid for. It's a correct. It's a Freedom to Farm Act. Uh, EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and this is the one I call payment for being a rancher. And you have to do a little work for this, although they're if, if you do some of the practices, am I right so far? If, if you'll complete some of the practices, there are some incentive payments, which are cash payments into your bank account. And if, if you manage it right, it can be quite attractive. CSP, CSP is the Conservation Stewardship Program. And this is the one Tyler calls a payment for playing along with the USDA. I, I say it's, you've been a good boy in the past, if you promise to keep being a good boy, we'll deposit a whole lot of money into your bank account for almost no effort. And I'll, I'll just be blunt and tell you, I've got a five-year contract that pays annually $15,600. I, I probably have to expend a half a day's effort and three, four hundred dollars. I had to buy a digital camera. <laughs> that's my, and that's... Uh, that's it. And it's a five-year contract. Uh, CRP is a conservation reserve program. That's one that we call payment for not farming. <laughs> and it, it is a true set-aside program. Uh, I'll, am I doing okay on time, Tyler? Okay. That's one of our biggest ones around here. It, and it is here also. And you also, is the tree planting here called forest reserve program? And is it a 20-year? But uh, so we don't plant trees on the high plains, so I'm, I'm totally unknowledgeable about it. We crop our trees before 20 years. Okay. So I, I won't say anything about trees because I know very little about trees. <laughs> we can tell. We do have, we do have not, uh, my soil types are right. We have what they call the small sagebrush in our county that grows about this high. Uh, <clears throat> what I call our trees on my ground are rabbit brush. And the, the variety we have will grow about a foot, maybe a foot and a half high. But it, it is a woody shrub. And I, I personally am trying to promote the growth of that. It's the closest thing that we'll have to a tree. Um, go, you can't go back. See, I want to talk just a wee bit more about CRP so I don't have to do it later. As far as the stated purpose, which essentially is to... Um, mitigate soil erosion, both from wind and water. It's, it's my opinion, and I think most people 
in the NRCS would agree, it's one of the most successful programs that the Department of Agriculture has undertaken, especially on the Great Plains and the High Plains. Because they, they've done a pretty good job of getting marginal ground that never should have been tilled out of production and stopping the wind erosion. And have any of you here ever been witness to dust storm? Um, Actually, wind is one of our big ones. It, well, all these dunes, all this sand is piled up. Yeah, sand, yeah, sand. Uh, a small windstorm, uh, dust storm, you wouldn't be able to look out that window. If it was in the building here, you can't see that far. It can take, a, I don't know the exact numbers, but a couple of tons of topsoil in an hour off an acre. And <clears throat> a, a little better storm, if it blows 12 hours, we have, of course, barbed wire fences about 42 inches high. The first thing that blows into the fence are the tumbleweeds, the Russian thistle and, and sometimes the coast weed. So the weeds blow into the fence, then the dirt blows into the fence. And it can literally, in 12 hours, cover a four-wire fence. Now, that, that's a poorly farmed field or a field that never should have been farmed. And you can end up with a blow ridge, some of which we have in Kiowa County that are two miles long. And they extend, depending on the circumstances, out about 50 feet on other side, on each side. And if, if you want to find rattlesnakes and rats, they're an excellent place. <laughs> you want to be careful riding your horse into one, because it, a lot of places there's a fence built on top of a fence, and you've got all that barbed wire down there and the soft blow sand. But the, the, uh, CRP has been very successful at stopping that. <clears throat> and then the other programs will maybe we don't have time. Okay, we'll possibly talk some about those if, if we have time. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about this incoherence and how so many of these programs are uh, at cross purposes with each other. In other words, you can get paid to go this direction. Or if you don't like that, you find another program, and you can get paid to go that direction. They're at cross purposes. So that uh, Tyler and I came up with this. It's similar to spy versus spy. They, there's a lot of destruction, and nobody nobody wins in the long run. <laughs> but uh, let's go to the first example. Then. Now, <clears throat> this one is a simple little example, that just to kind of get you warmed up and get you, get you thinking about what we're talking about. And we call it bats, the kind that fly around and eat insects, versus railings on your stock tank. If, if you take a cost share, one of the things that NRCS will do under the EQIP program is to cost share water development. Drilling wells, water pipelines, and livestock. They, they don't call this a stock tank. This is a livestock watering facility. <laughs> uh, and this one... Uh, Actually, this is one that uh, is not under NRCS, but it would be in violation of the contract because one of the practices you have to complete is a pipe railing around the tank. The purpose of which, I'm told, is to keep your calves from getting into the tank and drowning. Okay, are you with me? I do. Now, this is a copy of a piece of literature that you might even be able to pick it up here in your local NRCS office that talks about how important bats are. They do consume, one bat will consume hundreds of pounds of insects in a year. Uh, and they're a good thing to have around. But there are certain species of bats and some species of insect eating birds that only drink in flight. They swoop down onto the water get their drink, and swoop up. And of course, NRCS, USDA, would like to have a lot of bats and, and good environment for them. But now we have the problem. We've got a railing around the tank. These <laughs> bats have radar, and that railing messes up the radar, and a lot of times they hit the railing, fall in the water, and drown. So this brochure, and there's another more extensive brochure, are encouraging stockmen to remove railings and obstructions from all around their tanks. So we've got the NRCS on one hand saying, you've got to put these in if we pay for the livestock watering facility. 
On the other hand, they're simply encouraging you to take them down. <laughs> so this, this is very minor. Is it the same organization that's doing both? Yes. Okay. Same, same, same example. How, how, many, how much cattle right. die every year? Oh, and I've done a little research on this because I want to uh, maintain my little bit of academic credibility. I asked several of my friends and applied my own experience also, how many calves have you ever had die in a stock tank? <laughs> well, I don't, I can't remember one ever. <laughs> I can remember a couple in there, but we got them out. Uh, you know, and I've never had a problem. So, but anyway, that railing is, is very important. <laughs> Our next example, let me make a comment first. This is, is the same field of the, the first picture, uh, July 9th. And we've not, not done anything with it yet because of the <clears throat> dry conditions. It hasn't even sprouted any weeds, as you can see. So, but our next example is equip versus equip. Uh, now, when you hear it, you may not, as a board member, hear this, <laughs> but your neighbor comes to you and says, uh, hey, there's, a, there's some, I've heard that, uh, They've got some equip money, and they're taking applications. So one friend tells the other, the friend that hears this, his first question is not about what, what's the program, what will it do for my land, how will it help me. His first question is always, how much does it pay? <laughs> that, that is the first, first question. Uh, one of the main purposes, one of the main things that the NRCS is interested in, that's the Natural Resources Conservation Service, part of the USDA, is interested in our area, is preserving, conserving, and, and promoting the enhancement of the native rangeland. A lot of the high-powered ecologists have determined it's a vanishing ecosystem, um, so that there's pressure that way. Um, they're interested in seeing that native ground not turned into this cultivated ground. So we've, we've got a direct concentration. They're trying to preserve the ground. But on the other hand, they will make direct payments to you, cost share payments, to help you cultivate the land. Direct opposites. They pay for over 100 practices uh, out of our, in our county, different things you can do. Uh, on the conservation of native rangeland side, they will pay for things like water development, tanks, pipelines, wells, cross fencing, um, rotational grazing, and if you get deeply involved in the program, then there are incentive payments. Um, on the other hand, if you say, if you go into the office and say, I've got this piece of farm ground, it's pretty, it's, no, this piece of native rangeland, I'd like to break it out, sod bust it, and cultivate it. What can you do to help me? Terracing is a very expensive item, but one, one of the things that they would encourage or even require that you do to qualify for all the other programs, and they will cost share. And they will also, on terraces, this is just one, one minor example, once the terrace is watered down from farming, they will go back and pay you to maintain them. And I'll, I'll throw in this anecdote now that <clears throat> I have a friend who farms about 5,000 acres. Most of it he has terraced. I have, I have another friend who says if the ground needs to be terraced, it never should have been broken out, which is, is pretty true. Uh, so my friend goes into the NRCS and says, I'd like to maintain my terraces. What can you do to help me? So they work out a program for him. It pays him, in one winter, $78,000. Now, he's got miles of terraces. He bought a used terrace, terracing machine for $15,000, put about $2,000 of bearings and a little repair work into it. So he owns now basically a new machine. Takes one of his older tractors, smaller 200 horsepower tractor, the capital on that's probably $20,000, put about 500 hours of his own time into it and collected the $78,000 check. But you, you should be happy knowing that all his terraces are in good shape. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, they pay for other cultivating practices, deep ripping and how you use chemicals and no-till and a lot of things that encourage and help you to, to cultivate uh, ground that has been rain soil. <clears throat> now our third example has more, <clears throat> more subtleties and it's a, a little bit tougher to understand and you have to be a good game player and rent seeker to make this work. But it's the risk management agency versus CRP versus the NRCS. And the CRP, remember I said it, I want to be honest about it, it is a successful program. Uh, although my question is, I uh, ask a range scientist who was in on the original committees that developed the program, I said, Roy, have you ever thought about what this country would look like had there not been a CRP program? I said, do you, think, do you think that the private enterprise could have solved the problem? And he just, like, I could just see the wheels start turning. <laughs> uh, but, um, I've got to look at my notes here so I keep this. I wanted, wanted to explain to you, <coughs> remember the purpose of CRP is to take that highly erodible ground out of production. But we've got... RMA in the way, and that's the multi peril crop insurance. I'm going to give you an example of what you can do with multi peril crop insurance. This year, on that same field that I just showed you, <coughs> had I wanted to, I could purchase from a private insurance company $114 per acre guarantee to grow grain sorghum. The premium on that would have been $40. I'm dropping the cents off. So if you do the quick math, that leaves $74 guarantee per acre. I can custom farm that ground, including the tillage, planting, and harvest for less than $50 an acre. So what, 50 from 74, that leaves $24 an acre guaranteed profit, okay? Now, if, if you have enough acreage, or if you just want to increase your income, you can guarantee yourself a profit. And I asked earlier this morning, is there anyone here that's in the insurance business? Can, can I go to you, if I want to open an ice cream shop down here, could you sell me a policy that would guarantee that I make money? You can't? I like you. <laughs> I mean, I'll even pay the high premium. I'll pay 40% or 35%, whatever works out premium. You can't give me a policy like that? Because I like it here. I was thinking about opening up an ice cream shop. <laughs> I guess I'll stay in farming. Uh, so that's what, there's the temptation. Now, we've already got ground in CRP. I have ground in CRP. I've got cultivated ground. What happens is uh, the farmer takes productive ground uh, out of production, puts it in, in a 10-year CRP contract. On the other hand, RMA guarantees him guaranteed profits. So he places as much existing farm ground as possible in the CRP, and then he goes to that native pasture ground that the NRCS and, and the environmentalists would like you to leave alone. It's not as productive. It's... It, it's not as good, and he plows that out, puts the RMA insurance on it, guarantees himself a profit. So now he's got the rent from the CRP, which is, is guaranteed, it will produce more than pasture ground per acre, net dollars will produce, and he's got more farm ground, more guaranteed income. I'm sorry, tell me again, what's the motivation for taking the most productive land out of production? Well. Okay, it, it may not be your very most productive ground, but ground that is more productive than the rangeland. Okay. That, that's maybe the way we should have phrased that. The, the rangeland that's, that's left now is basically the worst ground, it would be the poorest ground for farming. But that's the best ground was plowed out first. And there, there is some ground uh, in our area that makes decent dry land. Uh, rotational farm ground. You don't grow a crop on it every year. Yeah. And so some of that ground is in CRP today. 
So it, it's good ground. There is some good ground in CRP. So, but instead of letting the contract expire and farming that because we want to continue that payment, we go over here to this native rangeland and plow it out. Less productive ground. The results, no, no net decrease in plowed land, so there's no erosion prevented. No net increase in wildlife habitat, that's one of the goals of the CRP. And the land that has lower productivity is now placed into produ production, which increases the chances of an insurance payment being made. The, the best case scenario is crop failure. 